Welcome back to our next episode in this series on off-highway vehicle design. I'm Lance from Modi Power, and again today we're going to look in a specific example. We're going to look at military vehicles. It's a difficult subject, but it encompasses all of the aspects we've talked about in this series so far. <music> So today we're going to talk about military vehicles, primarily armoured vehicles, but the majority of what I'll talk about is applicable to soft skins, to logistics vehicles. I'm not going to cover the topics in detail. This is more an overview and the special arrangements and thoughts you should have as you're designing your military vehicles. As always, the terminology. And there's a couple here, <laughs> the military is full of terminologies and acronyms, but I want to just introduce a couple. First one would be air portability, spelt as one word. It's the ability to be transported by aircraft, be that helicopter or fixed wing. If we're looking at the electrical aspects, there's EMI and EMR, electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic radiation. Flip sides of the same coin in some ways, it's how much radiation you're giving out that could be detected and how much interference you're causing in your systems and other systems. Now, military obviously has special requirements, special things that are involved in this application and no other. Quite frankly, it's an application one hopes one never gets experience in because it's war fighting very serious subject and probably the first one I've been challenged as an engineer to think about instead of trying to protect people I'm trying to harm a category of people some of those aspects flying lead IEDs amphibious requirements airborne requirements weapons capabilities armor and so forth that are pretty much unique to the military uh, application and in particular they can direct the course of the design sometimes it's as simple as one word and I'm going to show you an example this is a weasel it's a German vehicle German fighting vehicle uh, this one happens to be in UN colors as you'll see it's a small tracked vehicle with a big gun Highly mobile. And this one is a Lux or Lynx. This uh, is the same army. I'm going to put them side by side. See if we can get an indication of the relative size. Same army, same era, same weapon. What makes these two vehicles? so substantially different. In each case it's one word. In this vehicle the word is air portable, particularly under helicopters. And in this vehicle it's amphibious. So it needs a big bulky body to carry the, the mass on the water. You need to displace a lot of water to carry the vehicle. So Two examples for the same army in the same era with the same weapon, but very different design outcomes because one word was different in the definitions. 
Now, anybody familiar with fighting vehicle design knows what the iron triangle is. We'll have a quick look at it. The iron triangle defines the three major uh, characteristics of armoured vehicles and their proportions. We have mobility, firepower and protection. You sort of can't maximise all three. If you maximise protection, you lose mobility. Same thing if you maximise firepower. Vehicles just get too big and awkward. So when you're designing the vehicle, these are the characteristics you have to keep in mind. Somewhere in this triangle will be the balance of the vehicle you are trying to design. What are the trade-offs in mobility, protection and firepower you're prepared to make in order to achieve the necessary result. Now some people have taken the iron triangle and turned it into a steel hexagon. Still got mobility, firepower and protection, more trendy terms, but we've added in a few that again are fairly trendy. Autonomy now, we're seeing a lot of robotics and so forth in military vehicles. Connectivity is almost definite. The more data you can collect from your fleet, the better you can control it. And adaptability, often this is to take on different roles. I'd say to you that these new three topics are lesser topics. You need to define, in this case, survivability, mobility and lethality first before you move on. So this is one application I hope you don't have experience in. I don't, but I've done a number of vehicle designs for military applications by studying the subject and talking to people. But you also need to keep a bit of philosophy in mind. It's a truism that armies in particular prepare to fight the last war, not the next war. And you can see, for example, Right now, as I film this, the Ukraine war is going on. It's a very different war to Afghanistan. So all the IED protected vehicles and so forth that were developed for Afghanistan don't have the same application in Ukraine war because it, it's just a different war. It's a more conventional war fighting scene. So it's fine to look back at the last war and wars before that to get a feel for what might be required, but you've also got to think to the future. So let's, in turn, look at those three primary criteria from the Iron Triangle and, and tease out some of the implications of them. When we talk about mobility, we talk about speed, range and payload. We also talk about terror mechanics, and we've covered that in a previous video. The mean maximum pressure so you know you can cross the ground. The fording, that's always a tricky one because even if they specify the fording depth, they're probably specifying the still water fording depth. If you cross a ford, cross a river, a creek or whatever, there's a bow wave. And that bow wave can be considerably higher than the fording depth or the still water depth. So if you find yourself with the client specifying a fording depth, what is it? Is that still water or is it the bow wave? Big difference. You'll be looking at angles of approach and departure and ramp over, so ground clearance and where the low hanging parts of your vehicle are, um, trying to maximize that mobility. Trench crossing. Trench cross, I can't even say it today. Trench crossing is uh, a criteria for a lot of uh, tracked fighting vehicles, but also for wheeled vehicles. Uh, wheeled vehicles can also cross <laughs> decent-sized trenches, providing they've got lots of wheels. You'll also have to consider the vegetation that you're going to be uh, operating within, and the seasons, and the seasons in what regions. Is it hot and high? Is it low and wet? What is it? Now engines, for example. 
That's basically what gives you the oomph for the mobility. Military ratings on engines are much higher than they are for the civilian world. If you buy an engine to put in a tank and compare it with an engine going in a truck, you'll find the tank engine is much higher rated. And that's because they're not intended to last very long at operating at those high powers. One of the things I learned at the Royal Military College of Science in Shrivenham was the average life of a main battle tank in battle is three minutes. So don't really care if you've nearly worn out the engine as so long as you get through that three minutes. And yeah, that's a scary number, isn't it? It's also why they don't carry much ammunition on board. If you're thinking about gas turbines, like the Abrams, then please don't compare the turbine performance to an engine performance. Because when you use an engine, you have to put a torque converter behind it. The gas turbine is the torque converter. So if you're going to do an apples and apples comparison, you need to compare the torque converter to an engine plus converter. And that's where the turbine generally comes out in front. Also, the size, the weight, and uh, the general packaging. You can actually hold a, an Abrams turbine engine in your two hands. It's the recuperator, which is the, the um, it's like a turbocharger for, for turbines. The recuperator is huge, but the engine is quite small. So the Aussie Army uh, recently has reaffirmed its decision to be a littoral warfighter. Literal areas are essentially beside water, uh, rivers, coastlines, and so forth. So that decision, and it's based on the part of the world that we're in, um, is going to manifest itself in the design of the vehicles or the requirements for the vehicles. They'll be lighter, better mobility over soft ground, be able to be moved on landing ships and so forth. Moving on to protection. Well, the first one of those is camouflage. If the enemy can't see you, they can't shoot you. Simple. You know, that's why every soldier wears camo clothing. There's various components of that. And if I look at my list here, shape, shine, silhouette, movement, and surface. You need to consider all of those things. And then think about whether you want it to work during the night, during the day, or both. Because you can have camouflage, for example, against infrared that might be used at night. So that question translates into what frequencies have got to be disrupted or affected. What uh, sensing is your enemy going to be using? You also want to try and confuse your enemy. So that if they can see you, they don't quite know what they're looking at. And one simple example is to paint the doors on the vehicle black. So if they see the vehicle, they can't tell whether the doors are open or closed. It's, it's simple, perhaps silly little things like that, that may give you a slight advantage when you need every advantage. You need to think about headlights. They're great radar deflectors and, you know, very obvious. Um, they also reflect um, infrared light very well. So you need to be able to cover them or have special um, treatment for them. And particularly if you're a logistics vehicle, you might have the lowest signature logistics logistics vehicle ever but what you're carrying on the back might have this huge heat signature or radar reflection that just completely obviates whatever you've done for the truck I'm told the trick is to confuse the enemy enough 
So they fire soft weapons at hard targets and hard weapons at soft targets. Now, generally, that means that they're fighting an expensive war. They're using big, expensive, perhaps, missiles against targets they could have shot with a machine gun. And in, in both of those scenarios, the enemy will give away its position without too much return. The next and usual topic for discussion in protection is armour. Lots of decisions. If it's passive armour, i.e. a block of steel, the thicker the better. But there's a limit. You've got to carry this thing. You've got to worry about fuel consumption and vehicle size and the cost and so forth. So you need to optimise your passive armour for the threat you think you're going to encounter. Is it IEDs? Is it mines? Is it helicopters? Is it tank on tank? And put the armour where you think you're going to need it the most. The thicker the armour and the lower the angle, the better the result. But again, you can't have it low and nearly flat and still have a big vehicle. Keep in mind that slopey armour is really good because it increases the distance through the armour that a penetrator has got to go. But you need to be down about 5 degrees or less to stop a penetrator penetrating. And that's an armour-piercing round. You need to understand that armour is pierced by energy. It's not so much the bullet you've fired at it, it's the energy in that bullet. And the ability of that bullet to transfer the energy, the kinetic energy, into the armour. Energy penetrates the armour generally by fluidising it. So much energy in a small little area will fluidise the armour. And it's hard to imagine, but there's a lot of photographs you can find on the web of tanks from World War II that have been uh, destroyed. And you can see the spall. You can see where the rounds have hit and it's splashed outwards. So it's a, um, it's a fluid energy situation. And that's, uh, for example, why telescoping rounds exist. These are rounds that when fired sort of separate into three so that there are three impacts on the armour. That's because the first one does one splash, the second one makes the splash bigger and the third one probably penetrates. Telescoping armour. If it's a heat round, high explosive anti-tank, it's a shaped plasma jet and that's like a, an RPG. You'll see photographs from probably Iraq with vehicles with bar armour on it, like um, steel mesh outside the, the vehicle. And that's uh, an attempt to trigger that round before it hits the vehicle proper and maybe deflect the jet, but to actually give it enough standoff distance so the plasma jet, the directed plasma jet that comes from that sort of weapon, um, doesn't impact the armour. I understand the British Army also still like HESH, um, high explosive squash head. If you think of it as a blob, it is uh, fired when it hits the arm or it goes splat. And it, when it ignites, it sends a shockwave through the armour and spalls shrapnel off the inside of the armour. So... What, again, what sort of weapon are you defending against? Is it armour piercing? Is it hash? Is it heat? Oh, probably the lot. And basically, if it's missiles, well, you're screwed because missiles can come big enough from far enough away in any direction, and particularly if it's top attack. Very difficult to defend against. If we talk about tanks for a moment, there's the, some specific assumptions that the tank won't be hit below a metre in height. That's why side skirts are often not fitted. I don't understand the mechanism, but apparently it's in reality 
Rarely indeed does a tank get hit that low. But the most likely mistake in uh, firing at a tank is range. And the tendency is for the, for the round to land short. Uh, and that's another good reason for having a low height vehicle. Because the lower you are, the more likely anything falling short is going to completely miss the vehicle. One of the other assumptions that comes out of way back traditional tank on tank warfare is that tanks will only get shot in the frontal 60, 60 degree arc. Um, that's a, rea um, a result of the distance the tanks can fire and how far apart they can be spaced but generally what you'll find is the armour is concentrated in the front 60 degrees and that's why infantry should accompany tanks. The infantry are there to keep any tank killers away from the flanks and the behind of the tank. If it's active armour that explodes outwards uh, when hit um, again a whole different uh, field you have to consider whether that explosion is going to um, damage your vehicle perhaps your antennas or sights or kill the infantry that's surrounding you and yes I'm aware there are arena systems now that will sense an incoming round and kill it before it gets to the vehicle the active armor is reportedly quite good um, some can sustain multiple hits in the same spot but they are vulnerable to that eventually someone will burrow a hole through your armour. And it's not just bullets and missiles, penetrators that you should be thinking about. It's also artillery. Not just a direct lob onto your roof, but the shrapnel from any near misses. They can be equated generally to a particular round, like an SS-109 or armor piercing 762 or something and you can design your armor to to uh, cope with that and of course there's mines now any tank mines in particular are, are a problem they're a problem for tanks but they're a big problem for smaller vehicles of course people are killed by mines tanks are often killed uh, it's called a mobility kill. Blow off a, a road wheel, uh, break a track, and you can't go anywhere. You might still be able to spin around the turret and shoot things, but you can't progress forward in the battle. One of the risks in that sort of situation is overpressure inside the, ve the vehicle. That you've had a big blast under the, the vehicle, there's a m floors probably heaved, and you've got a big air pressure increase. Not quite a shock wave, but a big overpressure. It can cause a lot of damage to people, um, balance, ears, and so forth. One of the lessons that came out of the Rhodesian War, which was essentially a, a war fought with mines, is that they were able to make their vehicles ultimately quite mine-proof and return them uh, back into service within maybe half an hour of them hitting a mine. That's where a lot of this V-hull design has come from that was uh, prevalent in Afghanistan. But one of the things is that it's only effective if you're strapped in. If you've got a four-point harness holding you down. Otherwise you survive the, the blast, but you don't survive rattling around inside the vehicle when it does a pirouette in mid-air and comes crashing down. So seat belts, very important. I mentioned mobility kills, but there's also another way you can stop a vehicle. There, there was a round that basically sprayed the vehicle with gunk. Um, think of it as glue gummed up all the sights so if you can't see out of your gun sights you can't shoot so 
you didn't need another main battle tank to take out a main battle tank. You just needed something that could block all the sights. Something to consider. So let's now turn and look at firepower. Usually that'll be specified. If you're designing a military vehicle, the military is likely to have told you what weapons it wants to carry and how much ammo and so forth. But one of the big implications for vehicles is the military will tell you about the shock loads from the weapon. Whether it's a 50 cal or bigger, there's significant shock loads. If you're doing a light, light strike vehicles, perhaps a jeep style weapon, um, you can find that the loads from the weapon are significant and actually rock the vehicle quite a bit. World War II Jeeps in anti-aircraft use were generally fitted with stays that would go out each side and stop the vehicle from rocking so the gunner could get a stable firing platform. But the trick here is the military usually says this is the force and that provides a very different you think it's not really a correct approach. The, the figure might be right, it's a force for a millisecond. You actually graph it, it's an energy situation and you've got a very small amount of area or energy under the curve. So it may not be as bad as you think, just look at it from an energy point of view. One of the ways of handling that is to make sure there's a cushion mount. And things like 50 cals and 40 millimeter grenade launchers, uh, there are cushion mounts uh, available for it that will take a lot of that shock load out and allow the vehicle to stay more stable. Now lighter vehicles, in fact most vehicles in the military, will mount a 50 caliber or you know, if you're in Germany, an equivalent. Um, let's say at least a 50 caliber equivalent. The reason for that is that a 50 caliber is good out to about 1700 meters before the round starts to tumble. So if you see somebody, I'm looking across the valley, if I see someone over there, I can outrange them. If they've just got rifles and heavy machine guns or whatever, I can outrange them. I can shoot them before they can shoot me. It's, it's not so much about the caliber of the weapon, it's about the range of the weapon. And that's why you find most military vehicles, even if they're soft skins, in some ways, particularly if they're soft skins, have got 50 cals. Uh, or a 40 millimeter automatic grenade launcher. You'll also probably have to fit smoke uh, grenade launchers, that's almost obligatory on a, a military vehicle so they can back out of a firefight if they've <laughs> fallen into the situation where the enemy can fire on them more than they can fire back. Sensible thing is to pop smoke and get out. And of course, larger vehicles have larger weapons, um, but again, that'll be specified by your military force. So there are requirements outside of the Iron Triangle. One of them could be amphibious capability. We've covered that previously in another video. All of those requirements can apply here. Perhaps slightly differently if it's an armoured fighting vehicle. Uh, you're not going to have much gunnel height and so forth, but um, a lot of military vehicles are amphibious. Air portable. I mentioned it earlier, air portability, and that's a big requirement. And I just want to show you a couple of examples. This is a CH-47, a Chinook, and you'll see it's carrying a Hummer and a trailer t on two hooks. My memory tells me there's three hooks under a Chinook. So this is an example of external carry. Then we've got internal carry. Another Chinook being loaded very carefully by a uh, low height Hummer. I'm actually surprised that it fitted, um, although maybe it didn't. 
looking at this photo. Airportability is always about millimetres of clearance and um, making sure you're in the aircraft treadway and so forth. Um, I don't think vehicles were ever intended to go into the Chinook when it was first developed. And of course there's fixed wing. Um, the good old C-130 and now the C-17. So air portability is often a factor. You'll find for that air portable requirement there's generally G-forces involved. You'll have to come to terms with the tie downs in the aircraft, whether they're rated suitably for your vehicle and just how many tie downs, straps and so forth you're going to need. One huge note of warning. The Army will tell you, you know, supposedly what the maximum vehicle mass can be for air portable and it's probably going to be some sort of tear mass. It's unlikely the vehicle will be fully equipped and armed when it's being transported but it is possible. They might say this is going in a C-130 and it can't weigh more than 16 tonne. And you probably think, oh, that's the most the C-130 can carry. Wrong. There's a graph for every aircraft that shows range versus payload. You can have a lot of payload for short range. You can have a long range for a little payload. And it's a trade-off. You've got to be somewhere along that curve. The military tends to forget about that. They just tell you how much they, they want your vehicle to weigh. But you need to be aware of it when you're talking about air portability. It might make all the difference, for example, if you can break down the vehicle to a lighter load, maybe taking the weapons off it so they can get a long range, but for, uh, and that might be a strategic airlift. Um, but if you're going to go into a hot landing zone and it needs to be fully equipped, well, you've got a shorter range. So let's look at an example. This is uh, C-130J data. And here's a graph. You'll see payload and range. So pretty much you can carry that much, let's say 40,000 pounds, without a massive amount of inf impact on the range. If you want to go further though, you're going to need to drop the payload significantly. So you really want your, ve your vehicle to be up here, not down here. Now, now it's not just payload and range. Uh, the payload affects takeoff distance and it also affects the landing distance. Uh, and I'm not a pilot. There's probably no doubt many other factors involved. But it's not just a simple payload and range. But this sort of curve you need to know so you can structure your vehicle and show that you've just taken note of the situation and you have the best solution for it. Now I mentioned EMR and EMI earlier, the electromagnetic interference and uh, radiation. That's usually tested at some remote you know, desert um, test station where there's no television stations and no cell phone towers and so forth. Um, it's electrical thing, so I'm not going to go into it, but you will need to be aware of it. And then we get to the civilian regulations. You know, you think you're designing a military vehicle? Guess what? Generally, the military is too gutless to tell the government what to do. So you end up with limitations, height, width, length, mass, etc. Mass is an obvious one because you need to cross bridges. And in Outback Australia, there's a lot of old wooden bridges and no one knows what the ratings of those are. Length and width, well, width is the primary criteria. A lot of military vehicles are too wide. It's a, uh, it was a problem with the Abrams when they first came to Australia. They're based in the south. The prospective enemy and the training grounds are in the north. The proponents uh, suggested taking a train trip 
to get from south to the north, except they were too wide for all the loading gauge, too wide for what the Americans call a plate, and didn't fit on either the carriages and it didn't fit down the right of way. So there were special carriages and modifications to the right of way to make that happen. The military too will always be interested in maintainability and it's a big issue for them because in field they might not have the same sort of skill sets available that they would back in a workshop. So plug and play uh, replacements uh, particularly for electronics is uh, a really favoured thing. So they're not trying to troubleshoot a machine that's not working its best. They can just quickly use some onboard diagnostics, identify the faulty component, chuck it out and put a new one in. Um, so that's a big issue. This is also a good case for doing things like standardising hose sizes and maybe using reusable fittings just to make it easier for the machine to be um, fixed by the operators in the field. So they'll also require a high mean time between failures. But that sort of figure can be very misleading. What it really should be is a high mean time between mission critical failures. If it's a fine day and the windscreen wipers fail, who cares? Likewise, if it's a nighttime mission with no lights in use and the tail lights not functioning, who cares? They don't impact the outcome. So what you really should be logging is time between mission critical failures. Otherwise you're going to get bogged down in a whole lot of minor issues. Similarly, mean time to repair is important and that harks back to the plug and play swapping things out because you're also going to be judged on whether this thing is easy to repair. And that's, well, that's probably the end of the technical stuff. Now we get to the hard bits. The actual psychology of dealing with defence procurement. If you think as an engineer you don't need to worry about that, you're wrong. Because these are the guys that are going to decide whether your design is acceptable or not. So we've looked at the, uh, the iron triangle and the steel hexagon. Let me introduce you to the triangle of doom. So this is how procurement progresses. It starts at an end user coming up with a requirement that they send to headquarters. And headquarters say, ah, what do you know? Your tyre kickers, we'll fix this spec for you. And then headquarters will send it to procurement. And procurement will say, ah, you're just soldiers. You don't understand this stuff. We'll fix it for you. And then they'll go and purchase something that's invariably the wrong equipment because they didn't talk to the end user and the initial requirement has been massaged extensively before it went to a supplier. With the greatest of respect to the people involved, particularly those in uniform, the chances are they've never been involved in designing a vehicle. So they can write a specification, they can manipulate the specification, but they really generally usually don't know what they're talking about. They might know what it's supposed to do, but not how it's supposed to function. And this is where it all goes wrong. Back to the triangle, somewhere in here, there's a government loop as well. So headquarters will send it to the government for initial approval. The government will kick it around. It'll go back and forth a few times. And then after the politicians, who are no doubt experts at vehicle design, have uh, had their say, it'll go to procurement or it'll get kicked back to headquarters yet again. The point is that nobody on that triangle has had experience in vehicle design. 
they may have some technical qualifications in engineering and you know I've had the situation where I've been dealing with an officer who'd done his thesis on a particular vehicle design and that was wonderful the difference was I designed and built the equipment um, so I knew a whole lot more than he did about how to use that gear the reality is that many of these people will never have used this gear in combat too and that's that's a whole new um, aspect of things it's all theoretical till the bullets start flying and then when you've supplied the vehicle I want to test it the military has a weird way of testing you build a vehicle to the specification it's probably the lowest complying tender and then what they do is go and test it till it breaks you tell them it's a one ton light you know one ton capacity light vehicle they'll put three ton in it and go climb a mountain just to see how far they can push it and when it breaks they just hand it back and say oh sorry about that better luck next time this is part of the reason that military equipment is so expensive because the system is screwy so if you're involved in military testing if someone wants to provide a vehicle for military testing that's fine but insist it's tested to the specification and that you know anything that they do to destroy it beyond that is at their cost so in designing the vehicle you need to consider all of the aspects we've covered in previous videos from tire and crawler selection right the way through chassis and onto electronics it is a very interesting engineering challenge but it's also one that can provide some moral dilemmas for engineers the intent with most engineering is to ensure it's safe to use and in this case it's got to be safe to use but perhaps really unsafe for people on the other side of the fence as always the design is a spider web of interrelated uh, requirements a variety of different applications hot and high um, swampy lands landing craft all sorts of things air portability things you won't have to consider in the normal civilian environment and then there's the procurement thing and if you think I'm being a little too heavy on that subject yeah wait till you uh, get involved in defense procurement it's uh, completely illogical but it is a fascinating subject and it involves so many fascinating aspects that it's a great mental challenge for the engineer so enjoy that challenge while acknowledging that you have to be patient with a whole lot of the other associated crap that's involved enjoy it see you next time